Good morning, everybody. Today is October 28th, 2021, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project. The project was founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic and lockdown, and we have not stopped since then. Every week, Jean Lawler and I are very pleased to host these webinars along with Natalie to bring you cutting edge information for negotiators, mediators, and arbitrators. There's no charge for the webinars. We ask people to contribute to a food bank, either one suggested by our speaker or one of their choice, if they like what you, if you like what you see. And we sure hope you do like what you see and are able to contribute to food bank. One of the best parts of the program every week is when Jean and I call on each other to give the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed to fight food insecurity worldwide. So Jean, with a virtual drum roll, take it away. Hello and uh, good morning from Los Angeles, everyone. Today's number is still, we're still so close to that $200,000 number. Uh, it's $195,000, $195,250. So that's more than 2 million meals. And uh, that's just fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Well, that is fantastic. And perhaps today we can make Professor Leela Love the answer to that great trivia question, who is the speaker who put the Will Work for Food project over $200,000? in total contribution. So uh, let, let's make Leela the one. And let's introduce her. She hardly needs an introduction to this crowd because Leela Love is one of the most renowned and well-known and beloved people in the whole world of alternative dispute resolution. She's professor and director of the Kukin Program for Conflict Resolution at New York City's Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. She's co-author, along with Carrie Menkel Meadow and Andrea Schneider, of the leading casebook, Mediation, Practice, Policy, and Ethics. It's now in its third edition. And Professor Love has won just about every award that she's been eligible to win in teaching, authoring, scholarship, and, and everything else. I consider her a friend and for those of you who know her, I, I know that she's friends to many of you as well, and hopefully will become friends with the people who are meeting her for the first time today. Leela, we're just delighted to have you here. Please tell us a little bit about the food bank that's important to you, where you'd like people to direct contributions if they are in a position to do so. And then your presentation, the future of mediation, we're all looking forward to it very much, my friend. The floor is yours. Jeff, what a amazing introduction. <laughs> wow, you're um, engaged to do that every time, but thank you so much for, for calling me your friend. And indeed you are, I consider you a close friend and it's wonderful. I'm looking around the screen and so many people um, who I see as, as friends and colleagues in this endeavor. So I think the Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen is what I'm wanting to um, advertise to you all to perhaps get us to, to the uh, goal of over the finish line, it's not the finish line, over a line of uh, $200,000. So in New York City, in Chelsea, there is a soup kitchen called the Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen. And I have been loyal to it because, you know, it, it, it's such a warm place. I mean, not only is it meals for people, there are things like social services of all types, counseling um, in a variety of areas, including housing. Um, but most important, at least to me, was the warm welcome it extends to people who are in need of, of food, along with delicious food. Um, I think if I ever have the uh, ability to stay in one place for long, one time, for long enough uh, uh, to be really regular, that is not only where I would put 
uh, money or do I do put money, but I would uh, volunteer services. So with that, Jeff, should I jump into our topic or should we talk more about? Jump right in, Leela. Okay. Well, uh, um, so the ambitious topic of the future of mediation, that's not a uh, small topic. And I'd like to uh, start off by saying that I've been in the mediation business now since 1983. That's a long, long, long time. <laughs> and I'd like to mention what started me off and what has kept me going, because I think it is very pertinent to the future. You know, those sort of North stars that inspire us is what um, I think we need to keep. Now I'm thinking about a, a, the image of the North Star on the sea. Those, those stars are what we need to keep paddling towards. So for me, the North Stars of mediation were and are a process that promotes human understanding between people, that promotes collaboration and problem solving, and that helps people in conflicts with agreements um, they have crafted themselves. So understanding, uh, problem solving, and agreement. So why are we talking about the future? I, I think there's been some concern of late that the current state of affairs jeopardizes the future of mediation, if mediation is going to remain to be seen as having the unique potential to promote dialogue. Um, a group of friends at the International Academy of Mediators and I did a survey of what was happening, what is happening in the mediation field. And uh, among the developments is that the joint session is declining, actually disappearing in some arenas of mediation. Um, and what is rising then, of course, mediation via caucus, that is parties are, are being kept apart. So if one sees mediation, as I do, frankly, um, and I understand Jeff might be being provocative, as it usually is in this call. Um, if one sees mediation as a dialogue process where a neutral expert like yourselves, I look around at people on the phone on this Zoom call, um, neutral experts trained in mediation help parties talk in such a way that they can understand their situation better. Um, they can problem solve together, collaborate, they can come to agreements. Then if we are moving towards a type of mediation where parties don't even see each other. I mean, in, in many cases, mediators are not even holding a joint session where you get a visual on the party who is uh, sharing the conflict with you, your counterpart. So when Jeff asks, what is the future of mediation? I would just posit, as I have long done, and I'm sure Jeff will challenge me with as we uh, proceed, that mediation should have a clear meaning, should have a clear definition. Processes these days are called mediation, where the primary role of the neutral, the so-called mediator, is to provide evaluations to parties um, that direct the outcome of the dispute. This trend I just referenced that parties don't even get together at all in some processes called mediation um, 
is alarming because you it's not a dialogue that one would think. If the only people talking are in a caucus setting, the mediator and the lawyers. I do want to be clear because I'm sure some of you, or perhaps most of you on the call, do conduct mediations in a caucus only format. I'm not saying, please, I'm glad this is recording. I am not saying that's a bad process. You know, if you can get a deal done in a process that looks like a settlement conference, quite frankly, where you work with the attorneys to narrow the, the gaps between the two positions that people come in with, usually a, a monetary gap, if you can do that, that's a service, but I would call that process, depend on, depending on what's done, perhaps by a different name than mediation. Um, and it's a settlement conference. It could be if the primary tool is evaluation, a neutral evaluation combined with some aspects of mediation. But so my push, my... Um, urging would be, let's properly name the processes. Now, I'm thinking Jeff, who I'm seeing staring at me on the screen, will say, well, who the heck cares what we call it if it works and if it's what the parties want? Well, let me just say why we might care. Um, we might care because we need to build training programs who make neutrals as good as they can be, whether it's at conducting mediation, what I'll call mediation, you know, promoting conversations between parties, promoting problem solving, or as good as they can be as neutral experts. Um, I'm from New York and have sat on many committees there. And we have wholly different criteria for training and service as a mediator or a neutral expert, for example. And so clearly defining processes helps us get it right as trainers, as people who craft ethics codes and as, as the um, you know, court programs or others who set up panels of neutrals. We want to get the right people on the panels, right? The people who can, can do the job. So part of my, um, I think, pitch, let's call it a pitch, or let's call it a dream about the future of mediation, would be that it have a clear North Star and that it have all these sister and brother processes too, you know, settlement conferences, neutral evaluation um, that parties can go to when they need those other services. And that North Star, just one more time, would be that mediation is a process, a dialogue process between parties where parties are the primary focus, of course, with the expert support and advice of their lawyers um, beside them. And the parties come to better understanding, they problem solve, they collaborate towards agreement. Leela, let me ask you a question. Is it possible that mediation looks one way, for example, in matrimonial cases, as you call them in New York, divorce cases, where people are typically not veterans of the legal system, divorcing couples. They're so many times unrepresented by lawyers. There are intense personal issues, child custody and things of that nature. And that mediation might appropriately look very different, for example, in personal injury cases where you have perhaps relatively unsophisticated legally unsophisticated consumers on the plaintiff side, big insurance companies on the defense side, might look completely different in construction cases where you have many sophisticated, legally savvy players all over the place or in a, a commercial uh, 
kind of commercial insurance disputes that Gene and I mediate all the time where you have half a dozen insurance companies or more battling with each other about who's responsible for an environmental cleanup. Is, is it, uh, what can we do to avoid one size fits all, which may not be appropriate because we're dealing with so many different kinds of conflicts, even within the legal system? Well, naturally, Jeff, you ask a good question or a few good questions and, and hard ones. So I got a boring answer. It, it, it looks the same to me in different types of disputes, same North Star. Um, you know, we, we can take these um, case types one at a time. In some cases, you know, mediation might not be the best process. For example, you mentioned personal injury. I think a lot of panels for personal injury cases include um, a neutral evaluation component where parties are looking for expert guidance on the value of an injury, for example. Um, so a question might be certain case types would have a different array of process choices um, that attorneys would go to in, in cases. Also, and let me just add that you can mix and match processes. You know, there's mediation followed by arbitration or mediation where if you come to a stalemate on an issue, you can go get a neutral evaluation or bring in an expert. So, you know, there, there's kind of two roads here. Where we're headed is to call everything mediation. You know, just want a big sort of mishmash of whatever you do, you put the title mediation. Um, but another road, and to me, the future, the dream future of mediation would be that it's a process that saves this hope, this idea of promoting dialogue between people, understanding between people. I think, although I don't know if we can canvas it with this many people, um, you know, this, well, let me put it this way. I'm writing something I may call the death of dialogue in so many arenas, political, community. Um, you see it in law school. There is this inability of people to talk with one another. Everyone's getting more and more extreme. And I'd say people hate talking to each other. You know, they'll go to great lengths to avoid talking because there's so much fear of getting shouted at. But the people on this Zoom call, Zoom uh, meeting, are the experts in communication. We want to keep a focus as a body of experts on helping people talk, be in dialogue with one another. You know, we study in the training programs, we look at brain science, we look at psychology, we look at uh, the latest on communication skills. So much of that, you know, really isn't needed if what you or I are doing is giving a expert opinion on the likely court outcome, for example. What do we need to know about brain science or um what food might be more conducive to parties relaxing. So um, I would say, you mentioned divorce cases, Jeff. I, you know, I see the same dynamics and high conflict across case types. And I would agree with you that some processes are more suited to certain case types. You mentioned construction. Um, I think, you know, that in construction scenarios, the, everybody needs to get together and really talk out what the problems are and what the hitches are and how to solve the complex dilemma that certain 
uh, scenarios put the parties in. I think mediation is well suited for that. At the same time, it would be terrific to bring in neutral experts, uh, engineers, architects, and the like um, to inform the, the mediation process. So I don't know, case types, I've used and, and promote kind of the same model of um, having terrific conversations between parties to solve problems. How then, Leela, do you think about the fact that the parties in many commercial business and even a lot of matrimonial cases, they brought lawyers with them. The parties have exercised their free will and self-determination to bring an agent with them to advise them and perhaps negotiate on their behalf. What do you think is the right orientation for mediators to have towards the lawyers whom the parties have selected and empowered to a certain degree to come into the conversation with them? Well, it's, it's a hard question because as you pointed out to me, Jeff, some time ago, it's the lawyers who choose the mediators and hence lawyers have to, to some degree treat, I mean, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Mediators have to some degree treat lawyers as their clients. The lawyers are the people um, you're, you're trying to please. Here's the dilemma. Clients by and large don't know what mediation is. They're gonna follow the lead of their lawyers. And if what the lawyers want is a process that resembles an adjudicative process or a settlement conference, things that, what, things that the lawyers are very comfortable with, um, the clients are, are simply, frankly, never gonna know what they're missing. I mean, we have, I've had the, um, real honor of being the editor of two books of stories mediators tell, which are both books. One is the world edition and one is a US national edition. In both books, there are sto stories about um, situations turning around when parties sat down and you, you ask about lawyers. You know, there are some terrific uh, lawyers who are very skilled at representation and mediation. So in these stories, to the extent the lawyers and the parties stay with a conversation and really try to collaborate together, things, things change dramatically. I, I'm kind of dancing around your question. If what the lawyers want is a settlement conference, you know, the clients honestly will not know the difference, probably, unless the media in my world, my dream world, or I, and my practice world, I insist on people listening together to an opening statement that lays out the goals of mediation, that lays out the uh, plan we're going to follow, the, the process plan, unless people... Um, ask for, for a, a different route. And so everybody's on the same page. And I see Anil has his hand up. How should... Anil, my, my friend who I met in India a couple of years ago, if you have a question, why don't you just unmute yourself and ask? Yep, sorry, I, I didn't have my hand up, but uh, since I, you've just called me, I was just wondering, you know, a couple of things you mentioned uh, about accident matters and, and family matters. Um, and the third point was about, uh, you know, whether parties know that or not. So from, from the Singapore experience, I don't know whether this is a question, but more of a, a little bit of a sharing. We do mediation in, in, uh, in uh, uh, accident matters. I just, I just did one last year, which is a fatal accident. And family matters are, are quite often. And we do a little bit of mediation even in, in criminal matters, actually, uh, where we negotiate with the prosecutors on deals and all of that, right? So... 
I don't know whether or not we were in a state where, where things have changed uh, uh, dramatically. And, uh, and a lot of clients come to the table knowing that, that media, what mediation can do for them. I, I do agree with you that some of them expect the lawyers to deal with it and, and, and give them the answers or the mediators to give them the answers like a evaluated mediation. Uh, uh, but a lot more uh, are, are tend to now realize what facilitative mediation is about and what it really can do and that it's really in their hands at the end of the day. Right, so do you have any views on that? Well, I'm not sure what the question is. Anil, thank you. You supported a number of things yes. I said, and I agree with you. Mediation is um, being used across the board, but is it mediation? <laughs> That's, you know, I was talking to some mediators in a Southern District of New York program, which is actually quite strict about the protocols that mediators are expected to follow, which include having joint sessions. And um, the person I spoke with doesn't have joint sessions. He caucuses only. So, I, you know, it's always hard to say what people are really doing in, in mediation rooms. I wish we could get everybody energized and geared up because I think in criminal cases, as you point out, uh, victim offender mediation um, and in all these areas, we need to bring dialogue back. We need to make people believe again they can understand one another, that they have that capacity, that they can work with one another, that the, that human skill that is there, problem solving is alive. And you all, we, we're the mediators, are the people who are closest as professionals to being able to energize um, uh, the parties, the world, what have you, with, with a belief in human communication, dialogue, and ability to, to address problems, so. Leela, one way that I sometimes convince people to have joint sessions, I don't call them joint sessions anymore because lawyers chafe at that term, I tend to use the term direct communication as opposed to communication filtered through me. I tell them that when the communication is filtered through me, it's an opportunity for my biases, whatever they be, conscious, unconscious, or whatever, to infiltrate their way into the communication. And that if they want their communication to get through without the risk of mediator bias infiltrating those communications, they have to communicate with each other directly. So what are your thoughts either on that or some other practical ways that mediators might encourage people to engage in more direct communication, even though many of them will chafe at it and to many of them, the words joint session have a bad name. So if I were listing out how we might get people to try to come together in a whatever you want to call it, in a common space, speak with one another face to face, um, I, I think my first thing would be that almost all of us were trained or developed training programs looking around who's on this call, on this Zoom um, gathering to have joint sessions. So I, the famous Nike phrase, just do it. You know, we, we were trained to do it. We believe in it. We know how to do it. You know, to the extent you suggest that something is just the norm, this is what you do. You start off together We and, and we go as far as we can. Um, that's helpful. Now, obviously, you run a, run into clients that just don't want that. I, I understand that. But if, if you can, just say, here's the model. It works. Most cases get resolved. 
give it a try, just, just try it. I, I think that's one start. Secondly, I think in your, our opening statements, we need to educate people about mediation, about what the goals are, about what the um, flow is that will most likely bring them together. It, the same surveys that show that, that um, the caucus only model is on the rise indicate that mediators aren't even giving opening statements in some cases. And the opening statements, you know, for many people, it's their education about mediation. Sure, attorneys go over and over to mediations and perhaps don't want to hear one more opening statement. But apologies, Jeff, it's the client's case. It's their life on the line. It's their money. It's their interests. And so they are certainly entitled, if they're there, um, to an education uh, delivered via an opening statement about what the goals and opportunities of the process are. I see Richard Lutringer, my friend, raising his hand. Hi, Leela. Um, you know, I think part of the problem, it, I never have the problem in family business uh, uh, mediations I do a lot of because there are no lawyers there. And so the issue doesn't come up. They don't know enough to object to it because they think that's what we do. So that's not my problem. My problem is, as, as I think we all have, when lawyers are there who have got their already solutions, how they want to do it, how the process should be done. And I find I, I move back a step and I have personal conferences with the lawyer and his client a couple of days before the mediation. And there's a lot less pressure at that point. And the client can hear uh, and be part of the decision-making on that. And um, if, if one side hears, well, the other side is willing to do a joint meeting, it, it's kind of easier to get it going. Uh, and of course, I always run the thing uh, and say it's going to be cheaper because if I have to do an introduction to mediation twice, it's going to put an extra hour into the mediation that we could cut if I can do it at the same time with both parties. And I, the clients like that. And then, um, of course, then, it, then you can possibly, if everyone's, you know, I, as part of it is also to schmooze a little bit personally and get people to feel comfortable with each other. And if that comfort is there, then we can sort of slowly go outside of the uh, uh, um, introduction into, well, what really happened here? Or, or what do we agree on anyway, if we disagree? And, and keep that going as long as possible. But, you know, it's, sometimes it's a losing battle. <laughs> So Richard, are, are you saying that this, the orientation to mediation that Leela was discussing sometimes takes place in a preliminary caucus with each side rather than with both sides together? Well, I do it and I, I claim that's what the reason I do it. The real reason is I want to establish trust. I want them to not see me the very first time when they come into the meeting. So that's what we talk about. I talk about their family. I talk about other things too. But the way to get them there is to say, uh, I'd like to talk about the mediation process and so on. So, um, but the real reason, as you know, very well know, is to make them feel comfortable with us. And um, so that's the primary uh, goal of a pre-mediation private meeting. Leo, let me ask you a related question about the way we were all trained, because I think this is part of the root of the challenge here, and that we were trained to be commercial mediators based on methods which had been developed in community mediation and then kind of transported over to the commercial world. And in the community mediation world, small claims, whatever, uh, neighbor disputes, we were, the model is, as I understand it, that the purpose of the joint session was to set the agenda and that you come up with perhaps three points and that becomes that you filter out or synthesize out of the opening statements and that becomes the agenda. 
And in commercial cases, the agenda, the, the keystone issue in the agenda so much of the time is how much money does this defendant have to pay this plaintiff to get a release? That's yeah, kind of an overarching issue in so many mediations. So that the idea of a joint session for the purpose of setting the agenda has led to these inflammatory, bombastic opening statements that have turned everybody off to joint sessions altogether. So what about the idea of using a joint session differently, that if you have those kind of preliminary conversations that Richard was talking about, you can then filter out, well, where does the rubber really hit the road here? Why are these people so far apart? Do they disagree about the measure of damages? Do they disagree about the admissibility of a piece of evidence? Do they disagree about whether case A or case B will really govern this situation. And then having a joint session that's not really a plenary session for the purpose of agenda setting, but a joint session for the purpose of really drilling down into the one or two real keystone issues, and then setting the stage for productive caucusing afterwards. Does that sound, it, kind of, it works for me much of the time. How, do, how does it strike you? Well, to me, what you're describing is a process which leads to very distributive bargaining. What's, what number are you coming in with on each side? Let's work with that. Um, Jeff, I've never, you know, I've done a whole variety of cases, not in the numbers you have on the commercial side, but where you get the parties, not the lawyers, to talk about what happened and what they would like to see. You get different stories about what their interests are, what the possibilities are in the two books I referenced, Stories Mediators Tell. There's um, a lot of examples of companies which had a dispute, which had been monetized. Everybody had their positional demands about the amount of money they wanted. But when they got together and had conversations and experience and so on, it led to not just a payment of one side to another, although frequently there's that, but renewal of um, business dealings, business opportunities between them. So I don't, I, I see that opening um, session as a chance for each party to explain the chronology of what happened, their major concerns about what happened, what they'd like to see done about what happened, their stories. They, the op and usually if, if the, each side is lawyered up, the lawyers jump in to talk. And if I, as a mediator, say to the client, um, looking at the lawyer so to make sure there's no huge objection, is there anything you'd like to add? A whole nother story comes out from the client. Um, and there is back and forth, you know, and then the other side has the, the chance. And it's just a whole different atmosphere than sort of aiming for an agenda set by positions as opposed to an agenda set by the concerns that the parties themselves have brought in, whether it has to do with, you know, the delivery of goods or the, I, I don't know what case everybody has in their minds, but um, usually they're usually in commercial matters like any, like divorce matters. There's a lot of uh, issues around communication um, over the things in dispute. Uh, there are issues around relationship and so on. I don't know, I, I think to the extent the, the model of inviting and expecting everybody to talk about as they came in, to the other side, what was on their mind. Now, just to um, perhaps support, Jeff, what you said and what Richard said, I do have conversations ahead of time in certain cases um, with the parties. There's some panels you go on that 
you're meeting people for the first time at the mediation, you know, and then I proceed with an opening statement, but where, where I can, I have conversations ahead of time just to get a heads up about special issues and the like. Um, but I don't know, the agenda I would set is not around the positions the parties take, but around the um, interests that you dig out of the stories parties tell and the issues that have been uh, generated by interests getting frustrated one way or another. I hope that's... No, it's, it's so challenging, Leela, because they come in, they come in with their lawyers. The lawyers are girded for battle, perhaps not so much in the online environment where people are wearing sweatpants and blue jeans beneath these shirts and ties and they have their dogs and cats and kids around. So people sometimes are a little more low key, but when people come in with their lawyers, they're in the context of a lawsuit much of the time that has these legal issues built into it. It takes some work to, to get people to be vulnerable, to be willing to discuss some of these more personal considerations, to get the lawyers comfortable with the idea that their clients won't inadvertently say something that will tank or sabotage something on the legal positions. And I find often, and I'd be interested in, in your views, Leela, that what the kinds of conversations that Richard described, he does them perhaps a few days before the mediation. I tend to do them more. My first access to the clients, communication with the clients is generally when they show up either in Zoom or in the old days and perhaps the future in person in an office. And having those personal meetings where you can develop some rapport and chemistry with each side individually is invaluable in trying to, to get that broader agenda set once you sort of, you, you get the level of the legal positions. And then if you're lucky and if the parties are willing, you can get to some of the some of the deeper issues. What are your thoughts? Um, so, I have had like really good luck as expecting part, making it be known from the get go that I'm going to turn the floor over to say the plaintiff when we start. I wouldn't call them the plaintiff, but to Mr. Kitchhaven when we start and he and his lawyer can go with it where they wish. And then um, they'll have an uninterrupted chance to tell the story and then flip it to the other side. You know, you all talk, everybody always mentions how toxic and how explosive the conversations get. To me, they simmer down at some point pretty quickly. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but what I wanted to challenge this group with, I have noticed that in joint sessions, people don't make the outrageous statements that they make in caucus, that it gets more extreme in caucus where you're not having to counter this person you had a conflict with, you know, so that that environment where you're just being the friendly supportive mediator who maybe does some reality testing, you know, you can really say what an utter jerk the other side was, but if this so-called utter jerk is sitting there, you moderate yourself, so I, I don't, Leela, I find those caucuses, it's easier for the mediator to do it if you've had a joint session before, because then if, let's say, it wouldn't actually be you, but let's say hypothetically, you, you go spouting off, trying to ingratiate yourself with a client who thinks, you think the client wants to hear you chump your, you know, thump your chest and do all that. I find it's much easier in a caucus after a joint session. Well, I can say, well, that's very interesting. Leela, uh, when we were in the joint session there, I heard Ms. Lawler make this point and I heard Ms. Lawler make that point and some of that sounded pretty good to me. What do you think of that? As opposed to 
what you have to do without a joint session, which is to say to the lawyer who's spouting off, well, you know, the other side says this and the other side says that, because in my experience, that feels more like argument, like I am the sponsor of the other side's arguments. And it tends, it, it doesn't work as well. But if, it, if those caucuses follow a joint session, and then you can refer back to what Ms. Lawler or anybody else said, it looks more like the mediator's having a conversation with you about what somebody else said, and that's for the benefit of the client. And you can be as much of a devil's advocate as you want that way without appearing to uh, take the other side's position by and large. So I think the real untold secret of why we should have joint sessions, one of the true benefits is because it makes the reality testing and the caucusing afterwards go so much more smoothly. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about the relationship between the joint session and the subsequent caucusing, which might take place. Oh, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think any amount of joint session is better than none. You know, if people have seen firsthand, if you, the mediator, can refer to things that actually happen. But to some extent, some of the examples you gave, if you stick in the joint session, you, Jeff, the mediator, can ask, um, Leela, can you respond to what Jean just said? I heard her say, you might reframe it, you might do the active listening with it. And then I'm sitting there, looking at, I don't know if we're doing in your sessions last time, their first time, I'm looking at Ms. Lawler and I say, well, I, and I respond. So I think your techniques are good and they work and they're a little safer perhaps than the joint session. But if the parties can work the thing out together and if they're gonna stay in any sort of commercial relationship or there any possibility of that, or any family relationship, or any community relationship, then you're doing a service having them stay together, is what I'd say. I did want to mention one other thing, because I see we're short on time. Many of you have been involved with the mediation competitions, both around the country and around the world. In Paris these days, well, these days it's virtual, but in Paris for a very long time, there has been an international commercial representation in mediation competition. That means the lawyers are being judged on how well they do in mediation. So interesting because the lawyers um, and the mediators, but it's the lawyers frequently, I, I mean, according to the rules, the lawyers and their clients make the choice. They stay in joint session. They show they're good at having um, cordial conversations that connect with the other side. They show, what's amazing, lawyers getting judged on their listening skills getting judged on their cultural competence, getting judged on um, what sort of creative options and ideas they came up with, given the challenges, the scenarios um, throw at the lawyers. So there's kind of this dis disconnect in terms of what's happening at the ideal level of competition. So that's the ICC in Paris is the international sort of, or a international go-to competition. Our own local American Bar Association uh, representation and mediation competition, same thing. Lawyers, um, student lawyers are getting judged on working together with their counterparts, listening, being articulate, being creative, all these things. And yet in this, can we call it the real world? <laughs> Everybody's scared of dialogue and collaboration because heavens forbid somebody might say a sharp word or have an explosion. Yeah, they will have some explosions. 
we as mediators are good at dealing with that or normalizing that or bringing it back to um, a status where people can talk. I don't know if you all have followed chats, you know, uh, um, strings of conversations on various mediator um, listservs about what food to serve in mediation. But the idea is that you get people together, even if it's only at lunch, and the answers have been, well, always serve food where people have to reach in and get, you know, a, their sandwich from a common plate. You know, if they, the, the idea of breaking bread together, of sharing something together, of you know, is, is very powerful and can change the whole dynamic of a conversation. You know, so those kind of questions and, and ordering together, how do you figure out where, what to order? If you can focus on that kind of a potentially contentious issue rather than the fact that you ran over me or something. <laughs> Hard. Yeah, issues that, that we look forward to facing again, Leela, when we're back in person, hopefully sooner rather than later, and not all just running to the fridge for leftovers at, uh, in our mediations. I see that Gil Mansfield has raised her electronic hand, and I want to respect that and allow her the opportunity to pose her question. Gil, you want to unmute yourself, please? Thanks, Jeff. Um, a couple of observations and, the, and then a question, if I might. So I absolutely um, agree with Leela that about the importance of dialogue and that it is becoming a lost art, even within the mediation um, industry. Uh, like Richard, I also have preliminary Zoom meetings with all of my parties ahead of time. And as he says, that's about it's about building rapport, but it's also allowing the parties to actually say what they want to say in their own words. And also managing what you referred to as sort of grandstanding and and lawyers being bombastic in that open in the opening session, managing what their expectations will be about what I expect from them and about what might and what might not be productive. But Leela, what, I, what I'm particularly interested in, even even having done all of that, even having persuaded people that, you know, an opening session is a good thing to do, that everybody should be there. It's good for everybody to be able to see everybody else in the room. Recently, what I found is that actually I'm getting some pushback from parties themselves. And given that this is a process in which we try and honour the autonomy of parties and we talk about it being a party led process, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. When even when the process is managed and explained to the parties, you're still getting resistance from the parties to actually doing any more than just being in the same room. They'll be in an opening session, they'll be in a joint session, but they don't want to really say anything there. And they really only want to work with you as a mediator when they're separate from the other parties. So, I mean, I think you're right, Gil, that's a great question. Um, that it's the party's process and there's not any issue that's unnegotiable, in, including whether the party comes into the same room with their counterpart. On the other hand, I think, and maybe this is shifting, I don't know, I think mediators enjoy a fair amount of respect and sometimes deference. And one can say, you know, I've been in this business however long you have, and you know, you find that joint sessions are, are useful and the parties perhaps are gonna be their best, own best advocate. Um, so I, wh where I'm heading with this is that one has the chance to educate parties about negotiation in mediation and that frequently they will try it, you know, give it a try. That said, you're right. If they want to negotiate about the process to the end of not having a joint session, then it, it can be done that way. But it is a lesser process is, is all I'd say. I mean, sometimes you can get people energized about the thought of really hearing directly, perhaps from somebody who's driven them crazy 
what that other person's point of view is. You know, it's just not, it, I think Jeff made the point when you translate it because you're only doing caucuses, it's not as clear or powerful or accurate as the direct face-to-face. -face. But Gilda, good point you made. Don't disagree. We have a couple of minutes left. If there are any other questions, anybody want to raise their electronic hand? Mark Bunham, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to tell a short story uh, about a mediation I did two weeks ago, uh, which emphasizes how important a joint session is and give a little different spin on why it's important. Uh, this was a uh, business 50-50 uh, two partners, 50-50, they own the business. And uh, the plaintiff, uh, let's say person A, came to me uh, through their attorneys. They wanted to split up the business. And partner B wanted to stay together and work out the differences. I asked them each to submit uh, a laundry list of issues that was uh, contentious between them uh, prior to the mediation. And I had pre-mediation conferences with each uh, attorney and each side uh, differed. One, the, one side, A's attorney said it'll never work and B's attorney said, let's, you know, we can work together through, you know, through sessions and, and have it happen. So I went into the mediation thinking I was gonna put this back together uh, and uh, enable them to work together. It was a very, uh, lucrative business. They made a lot of money together. Each of them brought different skill sets to the business. One was a technician and did the work and the other side did the marketing and they each needed each other. So I figured at the end of the day, they'll get back together. Uh, so we went into joint session. I insisted on joint session. I always do. I always tell people, if you're using me, you've got to have a joint session. Uh, and we went into joint session and after an hour and a half of the joint session, just reading the chemistry of the two people and how they interacted with each other, how they spoke to each other, how they articulated each other's problems to each other. It was clear to me that they could not stay together and that, and that a divorce had to be had here. So what I'm trying to say is that a joint session is so important to give the mediator an agenda of how to conduct the rest of the mediation you see intangible things in the interaction between them. This was in person, by the way. And you see interaction, in, intangible things, the interaction of the parties with each other uh, that will really help you as the mediator uh, figure out how to get this thing settled and in which direction to go. Um, and, and it's a matter of the chemistry between the two parties. Mark, we got one minute left. If you want Leela to answer a question, yeah. if they say on Jeopardy, please make your question in the form of a question. I ask Leela to comment. Um, well, I'm curious, were you right? Did that, did that partnership yes. end up breaking up? It, yes, they agreed to a, a three month breakup because they're, most of their business is in the Christmas season. So they decided to break up at the end of the year, but work together till the end of the year. Yeah. Well, I, let me just say, Mark, I, I admire that you make it clear that I don't think I'd phrase it just the way you did, that if you're going to use me, you're going to have a joint session. I would say this is my model. This is probably why you picked me um, when you were looking at different op uh, options you had in terms of mediators. And I, I will... Um, hopefully persuade you after the, during the mediation that this model is a good one. Um, but sometimes, okay, I'll throw a question back to Mark. Sometimes I do do caucus only mediation despite everything I've said on this call because there's some real reason why the parties can't be together, whether it's um, somebody who's been sexually abused or is just too intimidated to, to work with the other side. I so, agree, I've had okay. sexual abuse mediations. I also had uh, a mediation where uh, a party died and his two ex-wives were fighting over his life insurance and they wouldn't talk to each other. I, you know, those were exceptions. 
Okay, my friends, it is the top of the hour and what a tribute it is to Professor Leela Love and our fabulously engaged audience that we have not been able to get beyond the tip of the iceberg on Leela's fascinating thoughts and insights and everything that everyone in the audience is able to add to the conversation. Please join me in supporting the Holy Apostles Soup Kitchen in New York City. And Natalie, if you would please put the information in the chat again, it's www.holyapostlesnyc.org, the Holy Apostles Soup Kitchen. If you're in a position to support it or any other food bank in your area, please do so. If you let us know, we'll add it to the running total. Leela, this was a spectacular presentation. You just knocked it out of the park. So thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for being here. Natalie, Jean, Sarah, the Will Work for Food team. Thank you all very much. We'll see you next week. And with that, we are complete. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.